when you ask what does the Major Brent Taylor Foundation seek to do, I think we seek to inspire the rising generation. What we want is that spirit of unity that I think is made beautiful with our differences as long as we don't let them divide us. Right. We can be different without being divided. And that really is probably at the core of what we're doing. We might use a parade or a flag or a bunch of photo boards to, to accomplish the mission, but that's the mission. Welcome to another episode of Relentlessly Resilient, presented by Minky Couture, a weekly podcast where people share real life experiences and the tools they've developed to move forward and live their best lives. I'm Jenny Taylor. And I'm Michelle Scharf. Oh, it is fall. It is time the chill for in the air. You, you got yours with you, I can see. I always have my minkies with me. I love them. I was at a fundraiser this weekend and I, I used it to sit on half of it to sit on the chair to make it a little bit more comfortable and the other half over the top of me Perfect. to keep me warm. Multi-purpose. Yeah, it was awesome. If you want to find a great gift for somebody that you love, if you want to find a blanket to cuddle up with, Minky's Hugs Blanket are phenomenal. They feel like a warm hug. You don't need anyone else. Just a Minky blanket <laughs> and give yourself some love. Just take that hug. I love it. You can find Miki Couture across the Wasatch Front. They have six locations, or you can find them at MinkyCouture.com. And they run sales online all the time. So check them out, MinkyCouture.com. Okay, today's going to be a fun day to just chat and get caught up. I'm so excited because, Jenny, you are so busy with your foundation, the Brent Taylor Foundation, in honor of your late spouse, Brent Taylor, and you do a lot of different things with that foundation. Why don't you kind of first kind of give us an overview of okay. all the things that the Brent Taylor Foundation does for the community? Okay, well, we kind of started in the aftermath of Brent's death and actually at his birthday, the first year that he wasn't here for that birthday. So he died in November. His birthday was the following July. And we had a birthday party where we raised some funds for a memorial scholarship. He was a student at the U of U at the time and... We just thought we'd, you know, do that in his name and in his honor. And a friend of mine that was very business savvy said, hey, if you can get nonprofit status with the IRS, people will donate more. And I just kind of in that fog said, okay, great idea. So it started as a scholarship fundraiser in 2019. And we now, I'm happy to say we have scholarships at Weber State, University of Utah, and Brigham Young University, as well as a couple of high schools, including his high school, Chandler High in the Gilbert area, Chandler, Arizona area, and one at Weber High, which is a community where he served as mayor. So started as a scholarship effort to try and find young people who would be motivated to become leaders and just involved with civics and patriotism. So that's where it began. And then over time, we've just found ourselves with amazing opportunities to serve in the community in line with patriotism and leadership and civics. So it kind of all comes together. One of the first projects we did was putting in a Gold Star Families Memorial Monument in North Ogden in 2020, and that's a beautiful granite monument. There's now five or six in the state and I think nearly 200 across the country. We are part of a national movement that puts monuments in that honor the families and loved ones of the fallen. So there's not a single name on it. It's not to a certain service member. It's not even to a certain war. It is to the families and loved ones left behind, and it's very beautiful. You can find those for sure in, let's see, North Ogden. South Jordan, Sandy, St. George, there's a couple more underway, and then again across the country. So we did that in 2020, and then in 2021, we got started with a project dedicated to 9-11, September 11th commemoration, and that year was the 20th anniversary of that event, and toward the beginning of the year, I was just working on my calendar and trying to keep life organized, which I'm not very good at, and early in 2021, I realized it would be the 20th anniversary later in 2021. So got with some friends and civic leaders up in the Weber County area of Northern Utah and said, hey, we should do something. And that grew into a beautiful event. It's the third year that we've done that now four times in those three years. And then we have another project that we call Family Flight, also in September, where we take Gold Star families to see a specific memorial in Georgia that does have the names of the fallen. So different from those Gold Star family monuments, this one is specifically to the global war on terrorism, specifically to those that died in the line of duty, were killed in action overseas during that 20-year conflict. So 
We provide the travel funding and arrangements for family members to go see that memorial, find their person's name. There's 7,068 names etched in stone. And so that's something we do. And then throughout the year, we just take flags everywhere and anywhere we can. We might do a leadership workshop at the high school. We've talked about that before. We call it the BT5 based on Brent's, Brent Taylor five-point system. Talk he gave at graduation from high school. We take flags to cemeteries if there's ever a veteran or service member funeral. We'll take flags maybe to a homecoming or deployment send-off for someone serving in the military today. And then we really have a great time taking our big flags to civic events like rodeos and football games. So right now it's fall, and odds are this weekend or last weekend, if you saw some high school football action, our flag was on one of those fields. Different high schools where they do the national anthem before the game. And it's incredible because the flag we use for that is 78 feet by 150 feet. And we will use about 100 students to carry and unfurl it. So they march out onto the field with it kind of raveled up like a snake. So just like this long piece of fabric. And then on the count of one, two, three, or whatever it is, they just unfurl the beautiful thing across the football field. We've got great drone footage of what it looks like. And we make sure that holding that flag are members of the student body and community from both teams. And we're even at the University of Utah, Utah State game in September, and that one was really fun. But the idea is to find what we have in common as Mm -hmm. Americans, what unites us rather than divides us. So we understand that if your team is red, you're red, and if your team is blue, you're blue, and we respect that. But for a couple minutes before kickoff, we're going to bring you together around that same flag. That's amazing. Those are so many things things that... The foundation is doing. Yeah, it's taken on kind of a life of its own. I joke that everything's been very organic. We never once had a business plan. I'm not a business person. I don't know what I'm doing, but we've had volunteers. We've had good momentum and energy and, you know, an opportunity will come and we'll say, hey, we should do that or we should try that. And then it works well. And a lot of times then we say we should do that again. So that's where we are. How does the money come in? That is a great question. Um, The money comes in often 20 bucks at a time. And we joke about that. I call it 20 bucks. How many 20 bucks will it cost to do this or that activity or event? But the truth of the matter is it just comes from donors, people willing to help and support. We do hold an annual fundraiser in November, and anyone listening is welcome to join us. It's always around Veterans Day in the Ogden Eccles Conference Center, right downtown Ogden. Beautiful facility that's just undergone, I think, almost $20 million of renovations. So it's just state-of-the-art beautiful. But we will seek partnerships from businesses, other philanthropic organizations, and people who might give us 5 or $20 to support what we're doing. We're volunteers. I don't get paid. It's a great endeavor of just love and labor but what we do does cost money. So, for example, right. the flag is expensive. The 9-11 project carries about a $100,000 budget just for production. We print these massive photo boards. We bring in lights and sound and audio. We parades. The only expense, really, I didn't mention. but we, How did you get all of those photos? I've been to the 9-11 oh, exhibit, and it is phenomenal. Thank and you. And the photos are... And they're, they're all authentic, and they're all... Um, most of them have come directly from either the Ground Zero 9-11 Memorial in New York City, or the Smithsonian National Archives. Wow. So they're real. They're they're photos that a lot of them came from news coverage during that time. They depict President Bush or later President Obama or Some of our elected leaders. There's one of Mitt Romney I noticed in there. There's a a whole section. If you haven't seen the 9-11 Project, before we show you this immersive experience of the morning of Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, We kind of introduce you to the 90s to set the stage for what life Mm -hmm. was like. And there's photos of, you know, Larry Miller, Stockton to Malone. You remember right before 9-11's terrorist attacks, we were getting ready here in Salt Lake City for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, those are coming back. So the photos, a lot of them just come from some of those national archives or some of the news media archives. And then one component of the 9-11 event each year, depending on where we are hosting it, meaning which city or which community, county, the first area you walk through will depict photos from that area to make it more local. So we began in Weber County. That's where I live. And we went to Davis County, back to Weber, and now up to Cache County. And so the first section will just show beautiful photos of what really makes that area home to those who live there, some of the iconic views. And my co-chair on that project, his name's Johnny Ferry, and he is brilliant. 
he works for Honeyville. His family's company is Honeyville Inc. Like mm-hmm. pancakes he and used grains. He's your representative. His brother is. Oh, his brother yes, is. It's his okay. brother and his wife is my PTA friend. So that's oh, how wow. we connected. And he's really involved in local politics and just community, making things better wherever he goes. When we first sat down in the beginning of 2021, I want to say February or March, I made this great impassioned plea about why it's important that we do something on 9-11 and how we need to educate the rising generation. And we promised as a nation we would never forget. And I feel like I did a pretty good job bringing Mm -hmm. the emotion. And then at the end I said, so I think we should do something And that was my pitch. I had no idea what we should do. And so, you know, we brainstormed everybody in the room. And in that room at the beginning, it was a lot of fire chiefs, police chiefs, and city mayors and council members. And then Johnny had come because, again, he and his his wife is my PTA friend. And I think I said, hey, if you want to come, we're going to do something for our community. And somewhere along the line, he just kind of had like this vision. That's all I can describe it as. He works in manufacturing. He's gone to a lot of trade shows. And so he started to notice that a lot of trade shows and exhibits will have those large photo boards, Mm -hmm. full color, four feet by eight feet, bigger than a person. And as he was thinking, you know, what's really left from 9-11 are those images. Right. There's not a lot of artifacts. If you've been to the beautiful Ground Zero Memorial. Yeah, I have. There's not a lot to touch. Right. But you can see and you can hear. Yeah. And you can watch video because there's so much of that media. So he just kind of started putting things together He'll tell the story that none of his children were yet born. His and my children are all post-9-11 babies. And so as he designed the actual exhibit, it was with them in mind. How do I teach my kids yeah. to really understand Well, you know, this? that's what impressed me when I went to the, I went to the one in Davis. And it was so full of emotion. In fact, a, I actually walked out a couple yeah. times. It can be intense. Because I was like, I was very aware of what was like, I, I remember that moment in time, right? Yeah. And my son was four months old. Oh, my goodness. It happened, my youngest son. And so, yeah, it just really hit me. And it was, it really does a good job at eliciting that emotion of that yeah. day. We call it immersive. And mm-hmm. we want it to be immersive. And the the question was brought up in the initial planning stages as Johnny was presenting this concept and we were recruiting volunteers. The question was brought up. But how will people feel after they see this? Because just like you said, it, it's intense and it's mm-hmm. a lot. And nobody really wants to celebrate 9-11. That's not the right word for it. Uh, commemorates probably more mm-hmm. appropriate. And so that's where we kind of refigured the ending. So instead of ending on the global war on terrorism that started largely mm-hmm. because of the events of 9-11, the last section is beautiful photos of American flags and Americans coming together. Yeah. To remember that September 12th right. feeling. Because if you stop on the September 11th feeling, it's hardest, despondent. Right. I, I feel like that's the hardest thing for me. I remember the emotions of that day. And I, I had planned to meet all my girlfriends with mm. our non-school kids. Yeah, the little babies. Yeah, you know, all of our school-age kids were in school. And we were uh, meeting with the, you know, five and younger kids at the park. And... At the time, I lived in Fruit Heights, and we were meeting in Kaysville at Barnes Park. And while we were there, we all noticed there's no planes in the sky. Yeah. It's so, so quiet. quiet. When we went back home. Especially right there near, near yeah, Hill Air Force Base. Right. Yeah. And not far from Salt yeah. Lake City International. Right. We hear planes all day long. Yeah. We are in a You're so used plat- to it. From, for everything. Was it just an eerie silence? It was an eerie silence. And I remember... I was actually laying on the ground nursing my son on a blanket. And I remember thinking, I don't like the sound of not hearing planes in the sky. It feels really weird. It feels off. Just off. But I remember how much like people seemed like we were more compassionate people. We were more kinder. We weren't so busy. It's like. I I think it brought us to our knees. Yeah, it was a humbling moment. It was a moment of reflection. And I felt like we really did come together energetically. Right. And you could set differences aside. And I think that's what, as Johnny and I have tried to work with the communities where we've hosted this and developed the project and improve it each year, that's what we're trying to capture. Yeah. Right? I want you to remember what September 12th felt like. 
but you've got to remember what September 11th felt like. And we have an entire generation too young to remember. You and I, anyone mm-hmm. old enough can tell you exactly where they were, what they had planned that day, yep. what what was interrupted when they found out. But here's what we learned. Not only do we have a whole generation that doesn't know, we're into the next generation. Right. We had school children come on field trips. In fact, more than half of the guests who come through this event, particularly this year, are K-12 through field trips. So we had sixteen or 17,000 people visit the event. Eight or 9,000 of them were kids. And some of their teachers are too young to personally remember. Because now it's been 23 years. So if you're a teacher and you're under 30, right. you and the kids you're teaching don't know. right. And so for us, one of the things we've kind of started to realize almost unintentionally, but I think very beautifully, when you ask what does the Major Brent Taylor Foundation seek to do, I think we seek to inspire the rising generation. Mm -hmm. To be patriotic without being bigoted. You can love your country without being a supremacist or Mm -hmm. an arrogant about someone else's country. I hope Mm -hmm. hope we all love our home. It's like your high school team, right? Right. I hope you have pride in your school team and I hope you want to beat the enemy at the game on Friday. But that doesn't mean you then have to be violent toward them or vile toward them. And so we're really looking at doing more and more in the space of the rising generation, which to me feels so beautiful because... Obviously, I'm a mom. I used to be a high school history teacher. I've always loved youth and patriotism and service. And it just feels like this is a place that can kind of all come together. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at going forward is continuing this educational endeavor of 9-11s once a year. We're usually in one county. Again, 15, 16,000 people might see it. But throughout the year, going to these football games and having 100 kids come hold an American flag almost the size of a football field. And of course, we give them a little lesson at the beginning, just enough Mm -hmm. to make it have some meaning. And then sometimes we're in the classrooms, maybe a student government class or an American history class or something. And whether we're doing a leadership workshop or just a civics lesson. Because from an education standpoint, we could argue there's never enough money in education. But even if we were to say, okay, we have a bunch of money in education, a lot of times the specialty dollars go toward things like math and science, engineering, STEM, all right. of those things. Oftentimes we want to get girls and f- females particularly involved in those. Or you might have a beautiful endowment for the arts where it brings in more arts into your education. And often what goes to the chopping block first are some of those civics classes and civics lessons. Even things like Boy Scouts of America and some of those service-oriented clubs, they're just not as prolific as they used to be. And so some of those conversations about citizenship Mm -hmm. just aren't happening as often. So we're excited to be in that space by bringing people together in a fun, energetic way. Like, if you think I'm exaggerating about the magic of touching a flag that big, come with me next time. Yeah. I am telling you, whether you watch it from the stands or you hold it, anybody listening, the big flag, the major, will go into North Ogden's Coldwater Canyon on November 2nd. And if you want to come to the trailhead November 2nd at 7.30 a.m., you can help us hike it up the trail. If you're not a big hiker, that's fine. Everyone can watch it unfurl at noon, November 2nd at noon, from the bottom of the trail, and then it will fly for two solid weeks. So... You can see it from I-15 when you get off the freeway in the far west Pleasant View, Utah exit. It's exit 349 on I-15. And as you drive east toward it, you just get closer and closer. We leave it up around the clock. We have an amazing massive spotlight that makes sure we keep all flag protocol. Flag protocol requires that you have enough light on the flag overnight to distinguish the stars and stripes and the star field. And so I joke, but it's not really a joke because it's true. The spotlight on that flag looks like the Batman light mm-hmm. because you can see. It's a beacon. Yeah, you don't yeah. just see the light on the flag, you see the beam. Mm-hmm. And I live not far from where the flag flies, and it feels like I'm always in my car. And so anytime I get off the freeway and drive toward my house, it's just, it's breathtaking. And it looks so little in the mountain. But to wrap your brain around a 150 foot flag on the football field, it goes from the 25 to the 25. I've got, we'll get some pictures and post them so you can see. So from the 25-yard line on the one end of the field to the 25-yard line on the other end of the field. And, 
You know, then you take that to a hockey game or a football game or a rodeo in the summer. When we go to the Ogden Rodeo, for example, it's always Military Appreciation Night, and we'll get volunteers from Hill Air Force Base Airmen and Army recruiters or whatever other military we have around. And again, 100 to 150 of them will carry the flag out there in a big furled, rolled up tube of the fabric, and then one, two, three, go. They just open it up, and it's breathtaking. And Mm -hmm. I think it reminds all of us that even though we have differences, and we have the right to have differences, Mm -hmm. that's what this country was built on, there's some things that can bring us together. Yeah. And there's a lot of things symbolized in that flag to where we don't want the flag to be the center of the controversy. We just want it to be the reminder of the heritage we have and hopefully ignite some patriotism. Again, patriotism is not egoism. It is not uh, supremacy. I think patriotism is a sense of duty and responsibility. Yeah. For a couple hundred years now, people have paid the price for us to be free, to disagree, to to speak it our minds. It is mind, interesting worship. because I, the younger generation, who is now voting, by the way. I know. Who doesn't remember all right. of this. You know, they feel like maybe we've been in a conflict for too long. And yeah. then, then it finally ended. It finally, and it, supposedly, and, I'm going to say in air ended, quotes, sure. it ended. And it ended very badly, and whether it ended officially ended or not. Badly. Yes, yes, awfully. And I have to say, as somebody who's very aware and follows these things, I was really taken back by the first debate where it was not acknowledged that it ended poorly. Right. Um, I Which was is funny because so if you took angry. man on the street interview to anyone from any political background, I don't know anyone that says that went well that day. Yeah. I don't know anybody that thought that few days at Abbey Gate in Afghanistan no. was well executed. It was not well as yeah. e- executed. And we lost many we pe- men and women yeah. in service. We lost and 13 was- in the blink of an eye, including one young man from the Taylorsville, Utah area. Yeah. Yeah. Taylor Hoover. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Local boy. I, I have the chills just thinking of, about all of that. And so I was really personally offended by the lack of knowledge or forgetfulness or just the lack of acknowledgement that that didn't go as well as we would have liked or it didn't go as planned or some acknowledgement but to say that we haven't lost any men and women it's just not true it's just not true and so that that was a hard one for me and it is interesting we have these young kids coming up that don't remember why we were doing what we were doing, how right. we ended up in this conflict, why we were there They don't there know so a long. different America. And that's yeah. one thing that's startling. So again, when we put the beginning of the exhibit together to take you back to the late 90s, remember, like our biggest concern in 1999 was what would happen to computers when Y2K hit, right? Because right. all right. the computers were going right. to roll over to zero, zero, and we didn't know what that would do because they would they would just wouldn't be able to process that. If you remember, and I'm sure you do, Columbine... The school shootings in Columbine, Colorado took place in 1999 and they were earth shattering because it was so unusual. Mm -hmm. Think of your kids and my kids. They've grown up in a world where there is always a school shooting. That's right. Always a mass terror event. Terrorism is just part of the vernacular. When the 9-11 attacks hit, terrorism was shocking. Yeah. The fact that someone would do that, the fact that someone would commit such a heinous crime on American soil... It's almost like you said we've gotten numb yeah. to it. So let me tell you where it's we... It's sad. It it's, is, and, it's, and it's disturbing it's to me. It's distressing. It is distressing yeah. because America has a lot of places for improvement Absolutely. and have for a 100%. very long time. So for me... And we always will. I yes. think we will always need to be improving just as any person or family right. or company does. When I was involved in, in women's health care and that kind of stuff, we ranked 48th wow. in in all other countries, every- third world countries have better maternal and infant outcomes than we do. Now wow. we're at 56, so oh. it's bad. Wow. I bring that up just to say there's a lot of room for improvement, but one thing that we were good at is terrorism was not on our shore. Right. And it is now. It is now. And it's been for It is a almost while. on a regular basis. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and that's disturbing. It's disturbing for our kids, our grandkids to have... To live in that kind of world. I mean, think back. Remember, before 9-11, you could walk to the gate at the airport with a pan of cookies or cinnamon rolls and just watch the person get on or off the plane. And You could take no your own water asked. bottle on the plane. <laughs> your own toothpaste, for crying out loud.
let me tell you a little bit about this Georgia trip we take because it ties into this and honoring those who died in the global war on terrorism, which again, largely began on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. And I don't know that it's ended. You're right to say ended in air quotes. Right. So I, I don't feel that yeah, it's we've ended. we've evacuated certain places, but we haven't We've left countries we've that left. we're no longer engaging with right. our men and women on their soil. I don't feel that this has ended. And I no, think No, we haven't defeated terrorism, that's no. for sure. And and we look at what's going on in Israel and with Hamas and right. Gaza and, and these issues are very complicated and some of them are intertwined. And they so, are and they're they're multi generational. I mean, mm-hmm. even millennial yes. type of things, meaning thousands of years of, of right. conflict. So Brent again backing up, Brent was killed in November of twenty eighteen. The following September, we were invited just as part of someone that had lost a family member in that war, we were invited to this new memorial that had been built a couple of years ago in Georgia. At the time the military base was called Fort Benning. People might be familiar with it. It's the home of the Army Rangers. It's since been renamed to Fort Moore. But there's this National Infantry Museum. And if you love a good history museum, my goodness, you will love this one. It's the history of infantry, which is the boots on the ground, the guns, the grenades, the land effort of our U.S. military. Outside of this beautiful museum, they have this memorial to honor those who died in the global war on terrorism. And I think it was finished in 2017 or 18. So when we went, my mom, my sister, and I, and my husband's parents I think it was only two or three years old, but what they had done and they'd gone through all the Department of Defense records for the statistical, right now it's 7,068 men and women who died in that war, and they're listed chronologically. So you've got 2001, two, three, four. You can see ebbs and flows. There are some years where there are just names after names after names, rows and rows and rows of them. Brent's year, 2018, we're winding down. It's a much smaller section on the granite. But there's multiple panels of granite that list every single name in chronological order. And every year on the Saturday after Labor Day, they rededicate this beautiful memorial and hold a series of ceremonies to honor. Every year they add names if needed. And it's interesting to note because they did add names this year, even though the war ended, air quotes. So if you remember the drone attacks over Syria. Yeah. Those who died in that conflict or that incident, their names were added this year. And, of course, they hope to never, ever, ever add another name again. But the history of warfare is is pretty ongoing. So my sister, mother-in-law, and mom and I went in 2019, and it was so positive, which is not always the case for Gold Star type of memorials. Gold Star is what the Department of Defense calls a family member that lost someone um, in a war or war zone. And so some of these events are heavy, Mm -hmm. dark, even depressing. I remember going to one such event at the White House, the Memorial Day weekend after Brent died, and just leaving feeling almost worse about things because everyone in the room is sad. Everyone in the room has lost someone. And the the weight of it was just the focus. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying we should dismiss that. Trust me, I've had plenty of heavy, dark days Mm -hmm. for six years now. But there was something different about this this ceremony and series of events in Georgia. So uplifting. You left feeling proud to love someone whose name is on that wall. Proud to be part of an American history bigger than you, your soldier, even your generation. Proud to be married to or the daughter of or the brother of someone that was willing to fight for freedom for people we'll never meet. I will likely never go to Afghanistan or Iraq. Mm -hmm. And so this event was just so moving and so uplifting, even while acknowledging the grief and the heaviness, that my sister and I looked at each other and said, we got to get more people here because a lot of people in Utah we knew didn't know about it. And I think we only got the invitation because Brent had died shortly after it was built. And so the people, once it was built, they started watching the news and trying to find people and maybe they contact you on Facebook or other mm-hmm. social media. So, but everyone's invited. Everyone's invited. So the next year was 2020, and we didn't do much then because it was 2020. But in 2021, we worked with a a partner we have at American Airlines, and we were able to provide 10 people a free trip to this weekend of events. The 10 people represented five deceased service members. And it was like a pilot experience to see if maybe we had just had a really awesome experience and it wasn't common or wasn't transferable to other Mm -hmm. people or other years. What we discovered was they had the same reaction we did. 
It was uplifting. It was hopeful. It was healing to be with other people who were proud of their person, even though they desperately missed that person. And so that was 2021. And then we spent time fundraising. We said, okay, now we have a mission. And in 2023, we took 65 family members on the same trip. We paid for their airfare, their hotel, rental cars, pretty much every single meal, gave them a t-shirt. We wanted it to just be something they could show up to and experience and not stress over the price of airlines because, oh my goodness, flights are expensive these days. Mm -hmm. And, And again, most people, our biggest effort is just raising awareness. Hey, do you know that your dad's name is on that wall? Because you probably don't. So that first year that we took a big group, we did have a couple of young adults, newly married, who had lost their fathers at age three or four. And now they're old enough to be starting their own families. And we had spouses, we had parents, even siblings. And sometimes the siblings really do get lost. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, if you hear, let's say, for example, you hear a, a man or a woman dies your first question is, oh my goodness, did they have children? Did they leave a spouse? And then, oh, their poor mother, their father. And often, maybe those siblings are, are forgotten or lost mm-hmm. in the mix. So we have some siblings that come. And then this year, we were able to take 187 people. Wow. It was almost too many. Like, it was just so many. That's and then like the beautiful, almost a whole plane. Yeah. It, except it couldn't be a whole plane because they came in from 18 different airports. Wow. So if it had been all from Salt Lake City, it probably would have been... So much easier and, and economical to charter a plane, which so maybe these are we'll people do in the from future. all over the country. All over. So we started here in Utah. We had probably a hundred from Utah and maybe the other eighty or ninety from out of Utah, mm-hmm. maybe connected to Utah or maybe just connected to someone who is connected. So for example, on this trip this year in twenty twenty four, we had two families, last names Allred and Keith. Their sons were killed twenty years ago in the same marine incident. Oh. On the anniversary of the 20th anniversary of the death date of those two boys was the day we got to the memorial. Wow. Their families were able to be there that day on that milestone day with each other. Wow. So, I mean, just beautiful things like that. And then we had some families that maybe it's been five or six years, maybe 10 or 12. And again, we had a, a variety of family members where it was some siblings, parents, spouses, and children. And just a real healing weekend where we were able to bring them to these events. So just to clarify, we don't host the events once we get Mm -hmm. there. The events happen with or without us. And in fact, we brought our nearly 200 and added to another 350 probably that were there. So these families come, whether they came from Salt Lake City or not, they're now in a ballroom for a beautiful dinner ceremony with almost 600 other people who've been through at least to a degree what they've been through. Mm -hmm. And so some of the bonding with these families as they're either at dinner or outside looking at the memorial, maybe they have the piece of paper and the crayon where they're getting the etching of the name to keep and take home. There's a bond that comes because of that shared experience. And even though it's slightly uncomfortable and the elephant in the room is, oh, you're here because your person is not, everyone's just able to be open and a bit vulnerable and say, tell me about your person. who is Was it your son? Was it your brother? Mm-hmm. Was it your sister, your friend? And there's some beautiful healing that takes place. So that's all Friday night. Beautiful dinner, beautiful visit to the monument. Under the lights, it's breathtaking. Then Saturday morning, they have a very traditional military ceremony. Everything you've ever seen in the movies with the general and the flyover and the flag ceremony. And again, some beautiful spoken words. I remember the chaplain gave a beautiful prayer calling upon Almighty God, something to the effect of the importance of memorials. And this chaplain referred to an Old Testament story of Moses and other biblical characters and and people erecting memorials to, to their God and other people of different religions, creating some physical, tangible place to either worship or revere and remember. And I hadn't really thought of a monument or memorial in that regard before in my own generation, but... It was beautiful to think of it that way. And then the families are able to just explore the museum. It's a little more lighthearted after the ceremonies are over. A local company there uh, outside the gates of Fort Moore lent anybody who wanted to their bikes to tour around the city, like a bike rental company. They said, just come for free if you want a bike. And the donut shop gave everybody a coupon for a free gourmet donut. And there were just so many gestures of kindness and support by Columbus, Georgia, the city surrounding that base where these families could feel they weren't forgotten. 
because that's everyone's fear, right? You're, if mm-hmm. you've lost someone, your fear is that your person will be forgotten. Your sacrifice is forgotten. Your loss is forgotten. And it was just a really quick weekend, Friday to Sunday, where all of these families were able to remember together, to be supported and healed together. And it it was life-changing, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. I think there were a lot of people who who would say it had such an impact in their own healing, whether their healing's four or five years in or 20. So you said it's open to everyone. You took 187 people just from your foundation. How many people are there? How big is this thing? When we were there this year, it was about 600 guests in wow. the, that attended. But think about the possible number. Right. There's 7,068 names on that right. wall. Even if each name on that wall only had two or three close family members, mm-hmm. to say nothing of friends and colleagues and coworkers, there's still a lot of work to do. As far as we can identify, there's about... Um, 75, maybe close to 100 Utah military personnel who meet the criteria to be on that wall. Now, just as a caveat, we don't pick whose names are on that Mm -hmm. wall, right? That's a Department of Defense statistic. And so of the names on that wall, we think there's about, you know, 75 to 100 of them who have immediate family here in Utah. But that's only immediate family. What about the cousins? What about the aunts and uncles? What about the sister-in-law? And so these 7,068 names represent American military members from all four branches, Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines, 20 plus years of a war, a conflict, and definitely all 50 states, if not globally, where some of their family members live. So part of our effort is to offset the cost. And part of our effort is just to say, hey, did you know it's there? And we had three family members that returned from last year to this. Everybody else was new. But those three that came back brought someone, you know, maybe they came by themselves and then they found it to be a positive experience and they wanted to bring, in in one case, the Allreds, the family that had celebrated the 20th anniversary of their son's death. The father and mother came last year and this year they were able to bring their adult children with them. That's beautiful. And bring the family. So this is an amazing thing that you do and just one of the great things that the Brent Taylor Foundation does. Where can people donate? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, MajorBrentTaylor.com is our website. And really, if you're listening to this and it's still October of 2024, we would love to have you join us at the dinner event. You can buy a single ticket. Your business or organization can sponsor a table of tickets. We'll have a silent auction and a live auction. You don't even have to be in attendance for that because it's all electronic bidding. So Mm -hmm. you can, you know, bid on something from your home phone or computer so if you'll go to our website, MajorBrentTaylor.com, or follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Major Brent Taylor Foundation, this is, we joke, it's our Super Bowl season. Mm-hmm. September and November are our busiest time of year. We have so many events, so many opportunities to serve. If you're listening and you're a parent or grandparent who wishes maybe the young people in your life had a bigger sense of patriotism or community or civic awareness, come serve. Come help us pound the rebar into the ground to put American flagpoles on at a veteran's funeral or a, a tributary field or something. Come hike the flag up the mountain. Come help us lend a hand to maybe a family experiencing a deployment of a What I really mother. love about the Brent Taylor Foundation is that it's all focused on patriotism and not on politics. While, he, yes. while Brent was a Republican, sure. he was sure. a North Ogden He was an mayor. elected official. He sure. was an elected sure. official. One of the big reasons that so many people have right. taken to him is because he was, was it they the say first? They say the first sitting politician to be killed in action since the Civil War. Which is, a, which is kind of crazy. Which is crazy, yeah. right? So that but is... Yeah, we aim 100% to be patriotic and not political. Right. We want you to bring your own political, religious, personal self. And I've been to the gala several times and it's never about politics, but it is all about Americanism and patriotism. And there's room for that in all political parties. I think maybe we've forgotten that Yeah, recently, especially, and this is going to be a contentious next couple of months. Right. But there's, right before Brent was killed in November, he had made a public post on Facebook about participating in the Afghan elections while he was there helping to provide security. And the last thing he had said in that post was, remember that as Americans, there's more that unites us than divides us. Yeah. And then quoting, you know, Abraham Lincoln in the Bible. And then United encouraging stand, people to vote. And get out and vote. Yeah. So go go vote and you can vote the same way that. I do or you can vote differently from I do. You can vote differently from mom at Thanksgiving dinner or from your brother and sister. That's fine. What we want is that spirit of unity 
that I think is made beautiful with our differences as yeah. long as we don't let them divide us. Right. We can be different without being divided. And that really is probably at the core of what we're doing. We might use a parade or a flag or a bunch of photo boards to to accomplish the mission, but that's the mission. Yeah. We need to wrap this up, but really quick before we go, how has this venture for you helped with resilience? Oh my goodness. It's taught me what resilience really is. It's taught me what I know a lot of other people have found, and that's in serving and giving back to someone you can find healing and hope. You know, there's some days where you just don't want to get out of bed. You don't want to be resilient. Like, I'm sick of being resilient. I'm done. But maybe somebody's depending on you. I'll tell you, the Georgia trip for me this year was incredibly, perfectly timed. We just experienced a tragedy in our extended family a couple of weeks before. Our worlds were reeling. I was reeling. I wasn't sure I could possibly handle taking 200 people on such an emotional venture and being there was absolutely beautiful because of the healing and the hope and the community mm-hmm. that took place. I would not be where I am in my own grief journey without the mountain of people that have come along through the foundation in terms of friends and, and fellow servants of our community. So for me, resilience is recognizing your weakness, but also getting to work with people around you to try to do something good yeah. because there's an energy to be found and maybe setting yourself aside or at least not feeling like you have to do things alone. Yeah. That's probably the biggest thing I've well, learned. Well, what I'm hearing together. is we need connection. The whole connection. purpose of this podcast is to let people know you're not alone. Yeah. We all have hard things that we're doing. Well, thank you. If you like what you heard today, be sure to give us a rating and review. It really helps build our podcast and help other people be able to find us. If you would like to be on the show, if you have a story of resilience and the hard thing that you did, if you'd like to share about that, you can reach out to us either on Facebook at Relentlessly Resilient or on Instagram at Relentlessly Resilient Podcast. And there's a calendar link and I will set up, you can pick a time and I will talk to you on the phone. We'll have a quick 10, 15 minute uh, interview, see if it's a good fit for the show. And we'd love to have you on. As always, thank you, Kelly Ann Halverson, our amazing, beautiful, and fantastic. Very talented. Talented producer. Um, she, She does so much for this podcast. We can't thank her enough. She really brings the professionalism to the show. So thank you very much. And thanks to our presenting sponsor, Minky Couture. Minky Couture. And whatever you do today, remember to...